Welcome to the 1820s. We've left the Regency period, though we're still in the Georgian era. And I have reached Josefina's timeline. Now, I've already made Josefina's skirt and camisa and sash from the American Girl doll patterns. I'll show you that in a moment. And I am now working on her Christmas dress. And most of the time, or well, actually all of the time, I lay out the fabrics in advance. I have a, a sewing box over there and it has the patterns I plan to make up until the eight, no, up until the 1920s. And then of course it's Molly's patterns. But I picked out all of the fabrics for these patterns in advance. So when I decided to make Josefina's Christmas dress, I had this material and I thought, you know, it's pretty, it's red, it's Christmassy. It would make a great Christmas holiday dress for Josefina. However, once I started working with the fabric, I was like, uh, no, it is one of those fabrics that is just fraying like mad. Now, there are a couple things I could do to make this process easier for myself. I could use fray check. I could starch the dress. I basically size it in whichever manner I thought was the best. But I'm just thinking, no, I will just make another. Because it's going to come, become a problem for me in the long run. And I'd rather it not be. And I'm just not liking it as much. So we're going to say no to the dress. Which doesn't mean I won't finish this one. But it won't be the one that I use primarily on Josefina. So let me show you what I've decided to do. Uh, here are the cut out pieces of the red fabric. And I have a piece of this green. Kind of looks blue. Kind of looks green and you might recognize it from the molly dress and there's just enough of it to cut out the christmas dress for josefina again now this one does need to go in the fold so what i'll do is after all of the bigger pieces are cut out i will take this small section fold it and then cut it on the fold as you can see there aren't a lot of pieces to this dress uh, it is I don't, I don't want to say simplistic. I guess for me it is simplistic. But it's pretty basic dress. It's very, this one's very Regency. And its style has the high waistline and the low neckline. So there's still some of that evidence in the 20s of Regency. But it's not quite Regency because Josefina, of course, is... Uh, Spanish influence, you know, and I'm not sure if we're considering Josefina Latina or Hispanic or I just maybe want to say Spanish descent. I need to dig a little bit more into her history and see what she would be considered at that time. All right, at any rate, the Spanish dress in many ways is considerably different than the typical European dress of that era. And considering that we are placed in this timeline uh, in the Americas uh, and uh, Josefina does have some native descent so you're mixing the Spanish dress with the native dress of that time. So it is it has an even different flavor than the European, I should say mainland European uh, dress of that time. So I'm just going to stop there and say that. I don't want to... I don't want to say something that's wrong because I kind of have to go back and reference because a lot of the patterns that I have been doing, well, actually all of the patterns I have been doing so far and the majority of the patterns that I will do 
are based on European historical patterns. And when we're talking about European, we are talking about mainland Europe, uh, France, uh, Britain, England, um, basically. And you know what? Some of it we might want to add like uh, Prussia and Austria. But that's pretty much what we're talking about that European continent when we're talking about European traditions. So when you start talking about Spanish traditions or whatever mix came from the Spanish and the natives, uh, the different tribal groups in the Americas, uh, even if you talk about uh, what will become Russia, their dress was different than that of the European courts for quite some time. So a lot of the dress history tends to be about European dress. And that is kind of a narrow space that I've been focusing on. So when we start talking about Spanish dress and native dress and even uh, the dress and what will become Russia, that's kind of out of my scope. I don't want to dive too much into it without really um, being able to kind of get really detailed. Now, what I did do is uh, I did some reading, of course, because that's just the way I am. And I found these two really great videos, one on making rebozos, the tradition of making rebozos, and one on dress in the Californias in the 1800s and early 1900s. And it is wonderful, it's a wonderful video. And there's also a lady who is examining her Latina or Latinx heritage through the dress of Josefina. It's kind of like the Kirsten Project, it's really cool. So, and she's done the research and of course she lives the culture, so that helps. Uh, I will link those videos below because you will find them very interesting. But in the meantime, I'm just going to discuss the dress making or the pattern making for the Josefina doll. I'm always cautious in what I'm saying because, well, not because I'm trying to be perfectly correct. Uh, it's just because I'm trying to be correct. If you're going to do anything that you're looking to have it historically accurate, then you really need to be as accurate as you possibly can with your sources. And I don't want to generalize or speculate if I don't have any source behind it. So just want to put that out there. All right. So when I first started the sewing of the American Girl doll clothing, when I decided to choose American Girl dolls, I chose them uh, for the historical purpose. And I had no intention of uh, collecting lots of dolls. And I had no intention of collecting their clothing because I'm making clothing. So that was not really part of the deal. However, once I started making clothing, I needed something for comparison because I needed to see the quality of the uh, sewing quality of the fabrics and the quality of the historical accuracy that American Girl was putting out because I was actually really impressed with their patterns and they get them as close as they can considering that these are toys when you think about it. So I started with, you know what? I'm not really sure who I started with. Ah, uh, well, technically Kit, because Kit came with most of her clothes on. And then Josefina came with a skirt. But I got Kirsten's uh, meat outfit. And then it was, um, Kaya came. And then it was Molly and Samantha. And I figured, well, if I'm getting everyone's meat outfits, I might as well get Josefina's, the whole outfit. And I kind of went back and forth about this because 
Josefina's patterns are basic. They're Josefina's patterns. Samantha has a huge uh, wardrobe. And Felicity has a pretty decent wardrobe. Kit has a massive wardrobe, too, for her time period. Um, I'm almost thinking she has more clothes than Molly does. And she definitely seems to have more clothes than Kirsten. So when you look at the AG patterns, you get a small sampling of, you get like two outfits and a night outfit. And this, two of the dolls have coats. Maybe three. Molly has a coat. So it's really small sampling and it's not anywhere near their meat outfit when you get it. You know, meat outfits are totally different than the stuff that you get in the, the patterns. Except for Josefina, because basically her meat outfit is a camisa, a sash, and a skirt. And the majority of all her other outfits, except for uh, the Christmas dress, uh, there's like a riding dress, and there's some other dress that are like full dresses and they're, they're kind of Regency-ish style. Everything else basically is a camisa and a skirt and a sash. So I didn't really need her meat outfit because I'd already had the skirt and I could just make the camisa and the sash. But after a while, I really wanted to see the quality of the American Girl camisa and the sash. So I went ahead and I got her things. I got the camisa, the sash, and the pantalettes, which gave me a great opportunity to compare what I was making from the American Girl patterns. When I compared the two uh, pantalettes together, and I really should have pulled, the one I made is on Sam, and the AG one is on um, Josefina right now, but I should have put them side by side so you can compare them. And basically, when you do the American Girl patterns, they are pretty much like what you would have gotten. So American Girl didn't give you this you know, halfway pattern for you to make, they pretty much gave you the same patterns that they make their stuff with. So if you're a decent seamstress, you can make those gowns look like they would if you had bought them from American Girl, which I was thrilled about. And let me show you the two camisas. This is the camisa I got from American Girl. Okay. One of the biggest differences you're going to notice between my camisa and American Girl's camisa, first of all, is the lace. My lace is different. And secondly, the American Girl one does have elastic. I'm not using any elastic. I'm not going to use any elastic up until I get to Molly and Kit. And that's only on their underwear because I want to be period appropriate as far as I can go. And I'm not going to get any elastic for some time. So... I have no elastic on my, and I have no Velcro. I detest Velcro anyway. I understand why American Girl uses Velcro because we're talking kids here and snaps and hooks are not really kid friendly. But I think Velcro not only tears at the doll's hair, but it tears at the fabrics because uh, the Molly outfit that I did buy, you can see that it's not damaged by play. It's damaged by the Velcro touching the surrounding areas so I, I just don't like velcro okay so here is american girls here is the one from the ag patterns okay it needs to be closed with a snap but i haven't closed it yet but pretty much this one's a little heavier cotton which is also what i wanted to see so uh, this is a cotton muslin, and I chose it actually for the underwear. That's actually why I bought it. But I had it on hand because I was out of the other cottons that I had used for the slips, which is more like this weight. This is a little heavier than a handkerchief weight. This is like a rag weight. There's a, I know there's a technical name for it or a thread count, but I don't, I don't know offhand. But uh, the... Stuff I've been making with the corsets and the slips is about this weight, but I was out of it. So I got the muslin 
uh, just because I know too that if they're all wearing slips under their American Girl doll dresses, I'm going to add a bulk that I don't want to add. So I didn't make it thinner. But basically, I followed the pattern and I have about the same without the uh, elastic that helps kind of gather this and make this a little puffier, which is really, really cool. I'm going to make the birthday camisa. I can't wait to see how that turns out with all the ruffles. So it just was really neat for comparison to have some of the clothing. I also discovered too that there are some American Girl doll clothes that I didn't like because I thought the fabric was more flimsy than the fabric that I am using. So that was a thought too. All right, so here are our skirts. This is a basic skirt. Really pretty. Uh, the underskirt part goes up a little higher. I didn't make this part. And I don't remember it saying anything about this part in the pattern. So what I did instead, let me turn it around. Okay, yes, this is a Velcro. Really pretty. Nice edge finishing. Uh, for my finishing, here's what I've been doing. Because this is surged and I don't have a serger. And I have a machine that sort of does zigzag, but not really because it's a cam machine and that cam gets stuck. So it's complicated. And that machine probably could use some cleaning because it kind of tends to eat the ends of small items. So there's two things I've been doing. First of all, in the patterns, it recommends a couple clean edges, clean edge finishes. So I can whip stitch myself um, and clean the edge that way. I can use the pinking shears to clean the edge, which I've done in some cases. It depends on what's going to happen to the fabric. Um, if it's just me using, I can uh, cut this with the pinking shears. So we're not a problem. Let me see where it went. one was. Cut the edges with the pinking shears. Yep, this has been pinked. I don't know if you can see that, but this has been pinked around there. It's been pinked across here too. And then I can double stitch two lines of stitching across that to hold that down. Also, what I've been doing is, see this one is pinked, is French seaming, uh, especially with like the Molly gal. And if you're not familiar with the French seam, it kind of works like this. You run a seam on the right side, fold the garment to the wrong side, and encase that seam inside of a new seam so that when you open it, there's no seam on either side. And I did that in the Molly dress, kind of wish I showed you, but I'll show you again later. In this case, for this particular item, um, for the waist, which is going to get the most friction when I'm putting it on and off the doll, I just uh, tucked it, tucked it under again, so there are no raw edges. And I did the same on the uh, sides where we're going to have a lot of contact with the body. Uh, on this side, I did not, and I did not clean edge this right here. I'm not terribly worried about it, but I could run a second seam if I needed to. Now. On the underside, where I put the lace, so I could have that same lace effect here, what I did was top stitch. So this is top stitched onto uh, this hem here, and that is covering the hem and protecting the top of it. So pretty much it acts like hem tape. That's an easy solution. And then this one has a hook and eye for it. I made this with a fat quarter. Okay, so when you make the skirts with a fat quarter, this particular skirt is not going to be long enough to put it on the fold. So basically what I did was I was very careful with the pattern. I cut it in half and I just seamed it up the middle. And you know what? Let me tell you, when you do stuff like that, if you read through the history books and the patterns, that is totally okay and historically appropriate because fabric was just not wasted. So 
things were pieced together when they needed to be pieced together and I got the pattern pretty matched up and so basically we're good to go. I'm already loving this right here. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I had a gross grain yellow ribbon that I matched up with this, but from moving from one side of the room to the other, it seems that I dropped it, but you'll see it in the photograph at the end of the video. Okay, everyone, thanks for watching. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe and click the like button and stay tuned for the finished Josefina Christmas dress, whatever I decide to do with it. Take care. Here's the finished Josefina Christmas dress. Uh, the other fabric would have been really pretty, but this one was much easier to work with. I think it turned out really well. Uh, this time I did find my zigzag cam, so I was able to put a zigzag edge on the inside. So pretty much all the seams on the inside are finished with a hook and eye closure. Get a little closer to it. And the tie around bow. On the dress for the pattern, it calls for putting the ribbon around from the front to and attaching it to the back and then tying the bow and attaching it to the front. Um, in this case, I just tied it around so I haven't decided if I'm going to stick with this bow. Actually, I kind of do like it. The pattern calls for one eighth inch. And this obviously is, I think this is a three eighths. But I think I'll stick with this. It looks really nice. So I'll go ahead and attach it on this way. Get around the side of it. It really does have that Regency look to it with its own kind of flair. If you've seen her Christmas dress from the Pleasant Company one, um, usually the uh, ruffle up here is a little uh, shorter, not quite as tall, but I liked it that tall, so I just I made it that way. Here's the back view. You can see the really nice gathers in the back. And this is a really deep back, open seam back here. I'm pretty sure she could get into the dress without the seam being that far down, but it's really nice. Gives you that option. You can see those nice tailored sides. The cool thing about this dress is you know, normally, you know, what happens is a lot of the modern patterns where you would put together the bodice front and back, you would close the bodice front and back, and then you would put the sleeves on. And so you're sewing the sleeves in a circle, which makes sleeves hard for a lot of people. But these uh, sleeves are put on flat. So the sides of the bodice are not sewn, they're flat, and then the sleeves are put on flat. And then in this case, instead of sewing the entire bottom of the dress together and then stitching it all the way around to the bodice, the skirt part was put on flat as well. First it was attached to the front and then the two sides were attached so the entire dress was flat and then what I did from there is laid it out flat and sewed from the sleeve the end of the sleeve all the way around to the inside of the arm and down to the bottom of the skirt so it was all completely sewn flat and what that allowed me to do is allowed me to finish the edges of the entire dress because a lot of times 
um, you when you close the seam up here you're turning the sleeve inside out and you can't always finish the edges around the arm side but because everything was flat I was completely able to finish those edges so it was really cool uh, this right here uh, is zigzagged at the edges to give that serger look some of the other dresses actually did a French seam on and that was pretty cool too this is Josefina's birthday camisa um, I wasn't gonna make this one but I made all Felicity's patterns and uh, you know, I figured that once I made one camisa uh, they're pretty close to each other so there's no reason to make another camisa but this one really is not the same um, the tiered sleeve hair with the ruffles is just really cute so I really couldn't resist the urge to make it uh, there was a lot of ruffling going on gathering uh, which I'm, I'm getting pretty good at gathering on the machine all the other gathering I've done so far has been by hand so I've really been working on gathering with the machine now of course this is a long camisa just like the other one comes all the way down to her knees and it closes in the back it's going to close with snaps I'm not using any velcro which is not a problem of course because um, kids aren't handling me so I really don't need, need the ease of velcro uh, then we have the same pretty much basic skirt pattern with just a little more decoration added to it now for this particular skirt there is a different color yoke um, attached to it than the bottom of the skirt which is what gives it this look and um, the there's the pattern for the decorative loops that are on the bottom of the original um, skirt I just I just didn't really feel like making them and there were suggestions for using braided cord and sewing it on freehand motion on the machine which I really haven't done with this machine but it is very much possible um, embroidering it on or using a fabric paint and I started to stamp it on with the fabric ink um, it's one of those things where I just kind of ran out of oomph and I was ready to move on so I just added the decorative ribbon where the pattern suggested and then I used a zigzag on him. I really wanted to use a decorative stitch. But on this Lady Lavender, I'm having a problem with the cam. Uh, it goes in, but it doesn't readily come out. So I spent some time trying to pry out the zigzag cam and couldn't get it out. And so instead of using a different decorative edge, I just used the zigzag. At some point, um, it's one of those pieces they say breaks fairly easily. So I'm going to have to find some really good way to easily pop the cam out by hand or find some way to fix the cam shaft so that I can take out the cams and use some of the more decorative stitches. But either way, I think it turned out, you know, pretty good. It's pretty decent for whatever my next round of Josefina clothing will be whenever I get back around to Josefina. Um, I might try some of the hand embroidery or um, I might, I don't know, we'll see. I might do all kind of stuff. We'll see how that goes. So basically, this is the end of Josefina. Josefina is 1824. And then I'm going to be moving on to Kirsten. She's next in the series with, I think it's 1854. And I am looking forward to the Little Prairie Girl. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to my subscribers. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and click that subscribe button down there and then click the bell for notifications. And you can always support my channel by getting something out of my Etsy store, whether it's yarn or requesting a custom order for one of the outfits that I've made so far. Or you can buy me a coffee. There's a buy me a coffee link in the description. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.